Good morning and welcome to River Church Online Worship. Today's an important day because we're going to be doing some vision casting, talking about where we're headed for the remainder of 2021 and the year 2022, the next 18 months. Things are beginning to settle down, uh, at least nationally. It feels like this pandemic is starting to wind down, which means that over the next 18 months, things are gonna be getting back to normal uh, more and more people are returning to public worship here at River Church. And I told you that today was a good day for you to make it back into public worship. Now, some of you aren't ready, and so you're still at home watching this, and I respect that. And I want you to be a part of where we're headed, this vision for the next 18 months. Uh, so we're making this video just for you. We continue in this uh, sermon series, The Great Exchange, and uh, we are, uh, we've been in the book of Nehemiah, and this is the second installment of the book of Nehemiah, and you're going to see our vision casting woven into this sermon today as we talk about the book of Nehemiah part two. Uh, let me just remind you, because it's been a couple of weeks since we talked about the book of Nehemiah. Let me just remind you that the nation of Israel, most specifically, Judah, the northern kingdom, but the nation of Israel, uh, they, they have been in foreign captivity now for a generation. Uh, and just recently in the story of the book of Nehemiah, just recently in the story, they had been permitted to return to their homeland from the foreign land of Persia. They'd been, returned, been, been given permission to go to their homeland, which was about a thousand mile journey. And uh, Ezra, the book earlier, Ezra had led the nation to rebuild the temple, and now Nehemiah is given the task of rebuilding the wall around the city of Jerusalem. And in so doing, returning the glory and the dignity of God's name and reputation to that city, the city of Jerusalem. And God had, had worked out all the details miraculously, such that Nehemiah, you remember he was formerly a, a slave, a Jewish slave boy in Persia. He had risen the ranks uh, and he had, he had achieved this esteemed position of, of cup bearer to the king in the foreign land of Persia. God had miraculously esteemed Nehemiah to that position, cup bearer to the king. And so in, in, in all of that process, what ultimately happens is that that the king of Persia shows him favor, shows Nehemiah favor. And, and he, he gives him a leave of absence, a building permit for the walls in Jerusalem, uh, money, and even a military escort for this thousand mile journey to go to uh, Jerusalem and rebuild the, the walls. Now you remember that there were two uh, antagonists in the story, Tobiah and Sanballat. Uh, at every turn, they attempt to thwart Nehemiah's plan, God's plan, to rebuild the wall, to rebuild the glory of Jerusalem. And yet, ultimately, uh, Nehemiah prevails, and, and the nation of Israel, they rebuild the wall. Nehemiah 12, verse 31, uh, says this, Then I, Nehemiah says, I brought the leaders of Judah up onto the wall. It's now completed. It's now done. I bring them onto the wall, and I appointed two great choirs, and we gave thanks. Skipping to verse 43, and they offered great sacrifices that day, and they rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced, hear this, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. The, the glory of Jerusalem, the name and fame and reputation of God that, that that city represented, it is heard, it is seen, it is felt throughout the land. But, but the story doesn't stop there. You see, it's a messy story. Uh, everything was not perfect in Nehemiah's life and in the the story of the rebuilding of the wall. You see, the entire story of the, not just the book of Nehemiah, but the entire story of the Old Testament is the story of need, of humanity's need for a Savior. 
humanity's need for Jesus. Nehemiah wasn't Jesus. Nehemiah, he, he led, he was a good man, but he could not ultimately hold it all together. Nehemiah chapter 13 tells a little bit of the, the rough story in the building process of the wall. It was not an altogether perfect event. Nehemiah 13 verse 4 says this, Before this had happened, Nehemiah is telling you this, Before this had happened, this being the completion of the walls, the, the big party, the two choirs singing, the great celebration. Before this happened, Eliashib, the priest who had been appointed as supervisor of the storerooms of the temple of our God, and who was also a relative of Tobiah. Remember Tobiah? He's one of the antagonists in this story. He mistreated Nehemiah. He attempted to thwart their plans to rebuild. He lied about them. He uh, discouraged them. He did all that he could to get the king of Persia to arrest them. So he did not want this wall built. Tobiah, he's the antagonist in the story. He's Nehemiah's arch enemy. So that what this says, Nehemiah says, Eliashib, the, um, the priest, he is the relative of Tobiah. Uh, and Tobiah, verse 5, had converted a large storage room uh, and placed it at Tobiah's disposable. So Eliashib, he converted a room in the temple and made it Tobiah's office. The room had previously been used for storing the grain offerings, the frankincense, various articles for the temple, the tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil, uh, which were prescribed for the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, their pay their sustenance, what they would eat, how they would live, the temple workers. That's that, this room used to be where they would store their, their goods, uh, as well as offerings for the priests. Verse 6, Nehemiah says, I was, not, uh, I was not in Jerusalem at that time, for I had returned to King Artaxerxes of Babylon in the 32nd year of his reign, though I later asked his permission to return, to return to Jerusalem. Verse 7, when I arrived back in Jerusalem, I learned about Eliashib's evil deed in providing Tobiah with a room in the courtyards of the temple of God. I became very upset. <laughs> I threw all of Tobiah's belongings out of the room. Then I demanded that the rooms be purified, and I brought back the articles for God's temple, the grain offerings, and the frankincense. Okay, the first offense, uh, Tobiah, the enemy of, of Jerusalem, he gets, he gets to set up office in the temple. Second offense, verse 10, Nehemiah says, I also discovered that the Levites, the Levites, these are the temple workers. These are like the pastors and the priests and the singers and the people that, 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 would, that would lead worship and care for, care for the people in the temple. I also discovered that the Levites had not been given their prescribed portions of food. So they and the singers who were to conduct the worship services had all returned to work, uh, to work their fields. I immediately confronted the leaders and demanded, why has the temple of God been neglected? Then I called all the Levites back again and restored them to their proper duties. At, or, and once more, all the people of Judah began bringing their tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil to the temple storerooms. That's offense number two. Number, offense number one, they defamed the temple by letting this pagan dude, Tobiah, set up office. Number two, the people... They, they stopped giving to the, to the ministry. They stopped giving their tithes, their offerings, and so the, the temple workers had to go out and get another job. Offense number three, verse 13, I assigned supervisors for the storerooms. Uh, this is actually part of, part of how he addressed uh, offense number two. Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, Padiah, one of the Levites, and I appointed Hanan, son of Zachor, and grandson of Mat Mataniah as their assistant. These men had an excellent reputation, and it was their job to make honest distributions to their fellow Levites. So actually, that's how Nehemiah addressed this offense number two. He put some good men in charge, honest men in charge, of distributing the payment to the Levites. Verse 15, this is offense number three. In those days, I saw men of Judah treading out their wine presses, working on the Sabbath. They were also bringing in grain, loading it on donkeys, and bringing their wine, grapes, figs, and all sorts of produce to Jerusalem to sell on the Sabbath. So I rebuked them for selling their produce on that day. So I confronted the nobles of Judah. And he asked, why, 
are you profaning the Sabbath in this evil way? I asked. So offense number three is they used to treat the, the, the day of worship as a special day, but now eh, it's just like any other day. Yeah, go to work, go to work. Offense number four, verse 23. At the same time, I realized that some of the men of Judah had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Is God against interracial marriage? No. Is God against us marrying into pagan religions and taking on uh, foreign gods? Yes. Again, verse 23. The same time I realized that some of the men of Judah had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Furthermore, half their children spoke the lang language of Ashdod or of some other people and could not speak the language of Judah at all. So I confronted them and I called down curses on them and I beat some of them, pulled out their hair. Imagine a pastor who pulls out your hair and beats you. I made them swear in the name of God that they would not let their children intermarry with the pagan people of the land. Okay, so several offenses here. What, what, what is going on? As I've said, the Old Testament is all about our need for a savior, a rescuer, a redeemer, Jesus Christ. We need that. We need that great exchange where Jesus takes our sin, our offense, and he places his righteousness on us. We need a savior. What is this story that I just read in Nehemiah highlight? Or Tobiah's setting up office in the temple and and the, 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 the people, the worshipers are neglecting to give to the temple so that the, the worship leaders and the pastors have to go back to work and they're, they're intermarrying with other pagan religions and bringing the pagan religions into their nation. What does this story highlight? Is it meant to simply highlight our failures, our inability to follow rules? I mean, if that's the point, then the entire Old Testament is a bummer. The entire Old Testament is just an indictment of how, how bad we really are. The real story lies, yes, in our need, but more importantly, what we need specifically, a Savior. You, you see, if the Old Testament, if it's just all about how much, how much you suck and how bad you are, you know, and, and how, how, how you can't keep the rules. And, and that's, a, that's a bummer. It's an indictment. And, and actually, that's what the rules do. They indict us. But more importantly, they, they, they point to a, a need in my life, a hole in my heart, a need for a Savior, a God who cares, a God who intervenes, a, a God who makes a way for me when there was no way, because on my own I can't find my way. But God, he intervenes, a Savior. That's the story, not only of the New Testament, but of the Old Testament. Nehemiah is a great man, and if you read the entire book, you get that. But he is not their Savior. Rules and regulations can be helpful at times when I lack discipline and when I need direction, but rules do not save us. In fact, because I'm not a rule, a good rule keeper, I break the rules at times, rules really only indict me. They make me appear as guilty, which I am. I'm a, I'm a rule breaker. And so the point is not how terrible I am. The point is how needful I am, and specifically how much I need a Savior. I mean, we follow and we fall into the same path, the same uh, pattern. Uh, you know, thousands of years later, we fall into the same pattern that the Israelites fell into in their day. Uh, we, we, you, you know, I. You're generous with your money like they were. You're giving to the church. You're giving to the ministry of the church. You're giving to, 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 to pay the worship leaders and the, and the pastors and the, and, and the work of the church. But then one day, you just your heart grows cold and you stop giving. I mean, the patterns in the story of Nehemiah, are, it's uncanny how familiar they are in our lives. You, you, you dedicate a day to worship like they did. Like Sabbath is the day. For, for, for the nation of Israel. We won't work. We, we won't tread out the wine press. We won't pick the grain. We will, we will worship on the Sabbath day. And in our day, in 2021, you dedicate a day to the Lord. This is our day to worship. 
Maybe you dedicate one evening to going to a gospel community. I'm going to be in community. I'm going to worship with other people at River Church. I'm going to commit time to the, the, the life and work of River Church. But then one day, ah, you just you grow cold and you stop uh, treating certain days. You start treating every day just like any other day. If I make it to worship, I make it to worship. If I make it to gospel community, I make it to gospel community. If I don't, I don't. And, and you just grow cold in how you see your time commitment to, 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 to River Church. And so, it, again, it's uncanny how we are like these people. At, at some point, we make special financial commitments to the, the life and work of the church. And then ours grow cold and we rescind that. We, we make time commitments to the life and work of the church. But then our, our heart goes cold and we, we rescind that commitment. The other thing that happens in the story is, is we guard our hearts against the wicked ways of the world. And everyone else around me, they're, they're, they're living life one way, but I'm going, to, I'm going to live a different way. I'm going to live a righteous, an honest, a pure life. But then one day, you just you stop caring about that kind of stuff. And you just start living life just like everyone else, just like the culture, just like what you see on TV. What, what people get mad, on, mad about on TV, that's what you get mad about. What, what people really love and care and spend their money on, on TV, you, you, you do the same thing. I do the same thing. We, we guard our hearts for a time, but then, then something happens. Our hearts grow cold. And what do we need? We need a Savior. We need a Savior who will supercharge us. To, to keep on doing the good works, to not grow weary in well-doing, to, 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 to press on. We need the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit to, to guide us, to, to give us hearts that are soft and that, that, that care about what God cares about. We don't need more rules. Rules can serve us. They also indict us. We don't need more rules. What we need is a Savior power in the presence of the Holy Spirit that, that softens our hearts, that, that gives us a new heart that, such that we care about what God cares about. Isn't it interesting what the people stopped doing when they no longer had hearts for the Lord? They stopped caring about the church. They stopped being generous. And they stopped caring about meeting together, worship, small group. Hebrews 10 says this, Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of Jesus returning is drawing near. Don't neglect to meet one another with one another. Don't neglect to meet together in church on Sunday mornings. Don't neglect to meet together in your gospel communities. That is an age-old struggle when our hearts grow cold. The Holy Spirit wants to soften, and empower, bring new life. They stopped, they stopped caring about the church. They, they, they stopped being generous. They stopped caring about meeting together. And they stopped caring about personal holiness. Start living, start living lives no different than their pagan neighbors. What do we need? We need a Savior. What do we need? We need the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit that, the, that, that Jesus has promised us in this new life as Christians. Okay, where are we going next now? We're going to be start, we're going to start, we're gonna, in this next section, we're going to talk about where we're headed over the next 18 months as a church. And it's quite relevant, or relevant to what we've been reading about in Nehemiah. God called Nehemiah to rebuild the walls. And, and, and Nehemiah cast a vision for the people. And they were able to accomplish much. But in their brokenness, what's really highlighted is the need for a Savior, the need for a mediator, the need for Jesus. I want to cast a vision for you today, what I believe the next 18 months is going to look like. But I want it to begin with this truth that we need Jesus. Short of Jesus coming and empowering us and breathing the Holy Spirit into our lives, we will falter 
we will fall short. We will grow tired. So our first need is, is for Jesus. It's, 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 it's for the gospel. Now, like Nehemiah, he looked at the need and he cast vision. I look at the need today and I, the need is great. What I mean by that is we are just getting back to normal from this year and a half off, basically. And it's easy for us to look and say, well, there's some people missing. You know, why can't things be like they used to be? And I don't think there is really any value in us looking back with any sort of regret, looking back and wondering if we can recapture the old, the old days. What I think we need to do, and I believe what is God honoring, is for us to look forward and to dream about what God wants to do in and through River Church in the coming days. What does 2022 look like? That's what I'm excited about. I am convinced from the reading of God's word that God loves Brownsville and God plans to bring renewal and revival. He plans to save the lost in Brownsville. He loves Brownsville. The question is, is he going to do it through River Church or not? And I would say, why not through River Church? Why don't we align ourselves with the heart of God and say, we know you love this city. We know you're going to restore and rescue the city. Won't you do it through River Church? I believe the next 18 months, we could see incredible growth. We could see in, in incredible renewal and revival. We could see deep community fostered. And I believe that there's a vision as to how we can, can see that happen here. I want to share that with you. How will we seek renewal? And how will we rebuild for a new day? Well, number one, we will call on Jesus. That, that's the greatest need. That is, that is the greatest need that we have. Else, we're just going to go through the motions. We need Jesus. That is the greatest need of our city. Our city needs Jesus. We, we are lost. We are wandering. We are, we, are, we are sick in our sin. And we need a Savior who will take from us our sin and brokenness and give us new life. Number one, we will call on Jesus. Number two, we will pray and repent. The scripture says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and, and to pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will forgive and heal their land. You'll be hearing about this soon, but we're going to begin a, a, a regular, a weekly evening of prayer in which you can come. It's not going to be anything fancy. It's just going to be a quiet time of us coming together and praying and, and, and seeking the Lord's face and humbling ourselves and repenting of our sin and saying, God, we need you. We need for you to show up in our, in our, in our church. We need for you to show up in our city. God, would you come and, and bring revival and would you do it through us? Don't, don't go around us. Don't skip us in the process. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pray. Number one, we're going to call on Jesus. Number two, we're going to pray and repent. And number three, we're going to be inviting our friends. We need some new faces around here. We, we need to, we need to uh, begin thinking who in our neighborhood is looking for a church, but but not, yet, but not currently going to church. We need to start thinking about who, who of our friends or, or are not, not currently attend. They used to be churchgoers. They're not churchgoers. They're looking for a new church home. Who, who in our lives might, might be willing, might be just, just wanting for a, for, a, for a home, for a community? We, over the last year, year and a half, we've lived very myopic, inward sort of lives, not really thinking about others, but now it's time to turn outward again and say, who in our lives might we invite to River Church? Who can we bring? How can we see our, 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 our influence um, 
expand, that we might, that we might be able to preach the gospel to more people, and, and that we might be able to invite more people into our community. I mean, if we believe that what we're doing here at River Church is really good, it's really God-honoring, it's, 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 it's really gospel-driven, it's, it's, it's really what we see in the Bible, what we're doing here at River Church really squares with the Bible, then we, wouldn't we want to share it with, one, with more people? We, wouldn't we want to see more people come here and, and, and get right with the Lord and, and, and get right with people and, and, and find a home and find some friends? If we really believe that what we're doing here is, is good and right and God-honoring, why wouldn't we want to invite hundreds, thousands of people to be a part of it? We're not, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really relying on you for that. I, I only know a few people. I mean, I know all of you, but, but you know way more people than I do. Who are you going to invite? Who are you going to invite this Sunday? And next Sunday, when we look at the city and, and, and we see great need, we say, wow, there's just need everywhere in Brownsville. So many people need Jesus. What do we do? Where do we start? Jesus told us that we start by praying. He said this. He said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send more laborers. That's what I've been praying lately. You know, Jesus looked out and he said, wow, in, in, in Jerusalem and in the nation of Israel, there's so many people that need, that need the Lord. And, Jesus, and here's what Jesus says. Pray, first of all, to the Lord of the harvest. This is his harvest. This is his work. Saving Brownsville, it's, it's the Lord's work. He's the Lord of the harvest. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send more laborers. Notice, we don't just automatically get busy. I've like, got to get it done. We, we say, God, would you send more people to River Church that would, such that we could link arms, we could work together? Send us more laborers that we might link arms and work together in the labor of, of sharing the gospel and seeing people saved, seeing the lost come to Jesus. We need more laborers. We need to invite them, your friends. We need to, to ask the Lord that he would send them, your friends, we need to ask that the Lord would send us more laborers. The fourth big idea I have is this. Um, we will give. If we are going to see renewal, if we're going to seek the Lord's rebuilding for a new day over the next 18 months here at River Church, we're going to call in the name of Jesus, we're going to pray in and repent, we're going to invite our friends. Number two, we're going to give. It's going to take money. It's going to take more money than we're currently seeing come, come, come through River Church. Uh, some of you, you give small amounts. I'm just going to pick an amount, but maybe some of you, uh, you give $100 a month, and for you, that's a really small amount. No, for some of us, it's a big amount. For you, it's a really small amount. And, and, and the Lord has blessed you beyond measure. And, and the Lord's calling you to give $1,000 a month, and right now you're giving $100 a month, and, and God has blessed you with wealth for a reason. You may think I'm getting too personal here, but, but, but God calls us to generosity because it's good for us. Look, the Lord doesn't need your money, but the Lord calls you to be a generous person because it's good for you. Some of, some of you, are, you're giving $100 and a month, and, and, and the Lord is calling you to give $1,000 a month. Now, now, some of you, you, you don't give at all. And, and maybe that first step is $100. Maybe that first step is, is I, I haven't been supporting the life and work, the ministry of River Church at all financially, but the Lord's calling me. It's a new day. I'm going to start, and I'm going to start with $100. To, to give nothing is to live in fear, my friends. It, it really is. It's, it's to say, I, I don't really trust the Lord's calling in my life to be a generous person. You know, the Lord says that if I, if I refresh others, I'm going to be refreshed, but I, just, I don't believe that. If I give others, the Lord's going to let me down and I'm going to run out of money. The Lord's calling us to be generous people. Some of you used to be generous, but like the nation of Israel in Nehemiah's time, you, you've grown cold. And I invite you to return to your former ways of, of, of giving to the Lord. Now, some of you listening today, many that are going to be in this room later on today, I'll say, many of you, you have been faithfully giving, giving 
of your total income or, or, or more, a higher percent of your total income. And here's what I ask of you. I ask you just to remain faithful. I, I'm proud of you. More importantly, the Lord is proud of you. I would just in, in, encourage you over the next 18 months, don't stop. Don't, don't stop giving. God will use your gift for his good purposes over the next 18 months as he has over the last eight years. This church financially has been built on the shoulders of, of good women and men who have been giving faithfully 10% or more of their income over the last eight years. River Church wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you and your good gifts. You stay the course. And those of you who have grown weary in your giving, I invite you to return to your former ways of generosity. Those of you who have never given, I invite you to consider that God might bless you as a generous person. Step number five, we're going to involve everyone. We're going to include everyone. We're, we're, we're going to utilize you. We're going to get you involved. The, those of you who have been largely anonymous, meaning you come and you go, you, you, you come in, you, you worship, you leave, you don't really get to know people, you've not really been had the privilege of, of volunteering in our ministries. Um, you know, Nehemiah, in his day, as they were building the walls, uh, his followers, they were tasked with inconvenient jobs and often even dangerous assignments. And the, 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 the crazy thing about the story is they seem to find deep joy in, in these assignments that were dangerous. Uh, when they were rebuilding the walls, we didn't get to read a whole lot of the story, but is there rebuilding the walls like with a trowel in hand? They're working the cement, they're working the mortar. In the other hand, it says that they had a sword because Sanballat and Tobiah, the antagonists and their armies, they were trying to keep them from building the wall. How inconvenient. They must have at some point thought, you know, if we just lay down the sword, we could be so much more efficient with the trowel. But no, in the story, they seem to find deep joy in the fact that there's danger involved. This is hard work, but we're doing the work of the Lord. Those of you who are anonymous, I mean, I know your name. I know your face, but... but you haven't really drilled down deep, really gotten connected, really gotten into a gospel community. You don't really serve, volunteer in any way. We're going to get you connected over the next 18 months. We need you. We're not going to be able to reach the lost, see our church's influence grow in this city, be the church that I believe God is calling us to be. We're not going to be able to do that unless we get you, those who are formally disconnected, involved, connected, serving, volunteering. I got a special word for the singles. Now, most of the singles have already returned to worship. You're probably not watching this video. You're probably here in person this morning. But, but I just, uh, I've, I've pointed this out before. Uh, I just want to point out again that, that God has been growing this demographic, the young adults, the singles, for some great reason, for some great purpose. In fact, that's always been a dynamic part of the demographic of River Church. The, the, the young adults, the, the, the singles. God's doing that for some reason. God, God's doing that for some great purpose. You're single. I want to encourage you. You, you, may, you, may, you may struggle with just wrestling with your singleness. Why am I single? Am I subpar? Am I going to be married like other people at the church? There's this beautiful verse, 1 Corinthians 7, where Paul says, two people that are single. He wants you to rest in this truth. He says, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life, meaning the concerns of married life, really. He says, an unmarried man can spend time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. The same thing can be true about it's true of a, a single lady. Now look, almost everybody in this room, almost everyone, you will eventually be married. So just rest in that, cool your jets. I know you want to be married, many of you. What Paul is saying is don't waste your singleness. Don't waste your singleness. Right now you've got you've got a, a special opportunity to to serve the Lord in a way that's less distracted than you will ever find in the future when you're one day 
married. Singles, if, if we're going to reach our goal to see, see the, the, the lost saved in Brownsville and see our, 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 our influence grow as a church, see our numbers grow as a church, Singles, it's going to take a special work on your part to give and, and, and serve and to, to invite. Let me say that again. Are you giving singles? Are you serving? Are you inviting? Great, great needs. We're going, to, we're going to task, we're going to involve everyone at River Church. It's going to take all hands on deck. We've got great needs. Those, those of you who have children, you're you're in the, 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 the married with children demographic. Listen, we need a high capacity person to lead our children's ministry. Pastor Billy's been doing that for a long time. It's time for him to step away from that responsibility and something, someone else take that on. We need a high capacity person to lead our children's ministry. Listen, it's time to reopen our nursery and we need some, some, some strong volunteers, some, some gifted uh, parent, uh, parent, you're already a parent of a, of a nursery age, or you just aged out of that group, but you know how to take care of babies, and we can trust you. We don't just put anybody in the nursery, let me tell you. We don't just put anybody in the children's ministry. You're, you're fully vetted, but, but, but we need to reopen our, our nursery. We need to uh, bolster our, our, our children's ministry with, with new leadership. And so um, it's going to take, it's going to take everyone. Senior adults, maybe you're in the retirement age. And I tell you this all the time, the Lord's not done with you yet. The Lord has dreams, plans, activities that are going to be deeply satisfying. Um, his plan isn't for you just to retire and, and watch the evening news. And, and I know that's not what you guys do. We got, we've got really healthy senior adults here. But the Lord's got a big plan, a big plan for you. And over the next 18 months, if we're going to reach our goals as a church, it's going to take your hard work as well. Number six and number seven, and we're done. Number six, um, we will, over the next 18 months, we're going, to appoint, we're going to appoint deacons. Many of you are already serving in that role as a deacon, but we're going to formalize that and bolster that office. And if you don't know what that means, that's okay. If you do know, do know what that means, then we'll talk more about it for, for both. Those who don't know about it, those who've never heard of what a deacon is, and for those of us who are, are well-versed in that language, we'll talk more about that in coming weeks. And last, number seven, uh, we're going to have a next-gen leadership training seminar. We've got a lot of people here who want to lead, but you just don't know how. You're just, you're just not there yet. You've just never been taught. And so if you fall into this sort of next generation sort of age group, we're going to have a, a six-week next-gen leadership training seminar. Um, I'll be there. Lydia will be there. Uh, our other elders will be there. And it's going to be good. And it's going to build for us leadership that will carry us through the next 18 months and carry us into the, the next era, the next iteration of who God wants River Church to be. Okay, now last thing I want to say Drum roll. This is a big, big one. It's a big, big news item, and that is Pastor Billy Garza has been serving us faithfully on a volunteer basis over the last eight years. He's going to come on staff full time. He's going to come on staff full time. Now, I know the first thing you say, how can we afford that? Let me just tell you, we can afford that when everyone here gives generously. Uh, just, just trust me in this. Let me just say this. I watch our finances really closely. I, I know who gives. I know the capacity that we have here at River Church to give more. Now, I would never, that's a, I hold that, that, uh, that information carefully. I would never come to you and personally call you out. But, but I just, I'm, I'm very aware, and I think you can trust me on this, I'm very aware of the fact that, that our capacity to give as a church, if everyone gives generously, we can afford to bring Pastor Billy on staff full time. There's a real need here at River Church. Uh, there is a real need that I cannot meet by myself as your lead pastor. 
The need is for Billy to be here during the day, serving you, planning, preparing, working hard during the day, not just on his, his off time, not just after hours, but working hard to lead you, to feed you, to protect you. We can do that. We can do that. I invite every one of you watching this today, every one of you uh, who will be here later today in, in our worship service, to, let's, let's link arms. Let's, let's join together as a band of brothers and sisters to say, we believe that the Lord has something new for us as a church. The next 18 months can be so incredibly exciting. I believe they're going to be. I believe that the Lord is going to save the lost and we're going to see many, many come to Jesus and be baptized here at River Church. We're going to see our, our, our sphere of influence grow here in this city. We're going to see numbers grow here at this church. I believe we're just poised. We're just ready for that. What I ask for you, from you, every one of you, is, is would, you, would you consider how am I giving of my time? How am I giving of my finances? And who am I bringing with me to River Church? I think the Lord has more for you. And many of you are already serving well. Some of you are already serving well. Many, some of you are already giving generously. But I think all of us, we can grow in these three areas. I invite you to join us and let us run this race. Let us run hard over the next 18 months and see what the Lord might do. Looking forward to it, my friends.